Okay. Well, we can see if anyone responds and can I go from there? Cool, cool. Yeah, sounds good. So, um, yeah, after our discussion last week about quantum entanglement, um, it was really interesting to kind of see how that kind of progressed into uh, at the at the very end. We were talking about uh, the possibilities of there being communication between these entangled particles through um, an Einstein Rosen bridge or a wormhole, uh, and and that was like a sort of a science fictiony kind of way of describing the, the the process that was going on and then we sort of thought well that's like a good lead into to talk about um black holes and and all the in their various yeah, forms absolutely. i think it's a it's an excellent uh thing and i think honestly the uh, the topic of black holes um uh, you know it's it's intriguing it there's a long history uh with regards to black holes you don't even have to you know, you, starting even back in like the 1700s with Laplace and Mitchell, um, and you, you know, and so these evolving things, um, you know, this, how how physics evolves. Yeah. In fact, I, I think yeah, that's sure. probably a good place right. to start if uh, if you'd like. And uh, you know, I know that you've worked in the gravitational uh, wave. Uh, observatory. That's so, right. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so we could talk about that too if, if, you know, as we go on. Yeah. Um, I guess that's like almost a, a deeper level um, of, uh, of understanding of, of uh, curved space time and things like that. Um, maybe we should start with like the general process for, uh, you know, black hole formation and, um, you know, how, depending on the mass of the star, when it, when it supernovas, if it goes to a white dwarf or, or whether it's sufficiently large that it's, that it continues to that sort of neutron, neutron star sort of state or if it, cause you know how there's like these different levels, like there's like the Kandra Seca limits and then it, it then it keeps going down and it's it's really basically proportional just to the the size of the of the star and then as it sort of uh runs out of fuel like nuclear fuel and it starts to like the gravitational uh collapse happens because it, it that that mass has got so much gravity but there's no outward thermal pressure uh from the the nuclear fuel that's that's exhausted but maybe is that something you can talk about that to kind of explain that process a bit more sure. uh, yeah uh yeah sure hold on uh, just one second I'm, i want to try to pin some stuff to the top um sure sure well before i think before we get kind of started on that uh i did kind of want to hold on pin to profile how do you pin to the top of the do you know how to pin oh man yeah, I think you can if it's a tweet, like you can pin other tweets to it, but I'd, you have to go to that tweet and then share it. But um, I don't think you can just put links because I was trying last week to just put those um, uh, cryptographic uh, uh, quantum computers and stuff. But yeah, um, see how you go with that. Maybe I'll just keep talking in the background. So, um, I guess, you know, that's the interesting thing is like, you know, our sun, uh, is, is not particularly large in the grand scheme of things. Um, and, you know, once it goes red giant and, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uses up its fuel in sort of 5 billion years or whatever, it's, um, it's not going to turn into a black hole. It's, it, it's, I think it's 1.4 times of our solar mass is that Kandra Sekar limit where it will sort of, it will, it will go from a white dwarf into a, like a neutron star. Um, and then there's that other limit. Um, yeah, I forget what it's called, but it's got like Oppenheimer's in it. Yeah. 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 Oppenheimer's, um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's really interesting the way that it's sort of like, it will, this process will happen. Like once the nuclear fuel runs out the, and the thermal pressure 
and the electron degeneracy uh, pressure, outward pressure, you can't match the gravitational collapse. It will happen, and it's just a just a math, just a question of size. Um, so there's and there's just you know this process um, that happens, and and it might just stop at a at a neutron star, um, which are pretty <coughs> fascinating in the in their own right. I mean, the 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 neutron stars are actually surprisingly small when you look at the um, the diameter. You know, the the radius they're talking about like ten kilometer radius. Right. Um, so they're, they're the size of a small of a small town or a small city, um, but they can have like, you know, it's that whole a teaspoon of a neutron star because they're just basically pure neutrons. Uh, they're just stripped of all the atoms are just stripped down to all neutrons. Uh, like a teaspoon of, of neutronium is like weighs like as much as Mount Everest. You know, it's like whatever it is, a hundred billion tons or something stupid. So um, those are pretty fascinating. The fact that there's all these neutron stars out there, and then you get rotating, uh, you know, pulsars. Um, uh, and yeah, it is also interesting to think about like these black holes when they they form accretion disks when they're drawing in all this this gas, and then they have these jets which are. We can detect them by sometimes just the the jets of like compressed particles that are being, sh you know, shot out at their poles, which is a uh, kind of interesting. Um, and one thing I should probably say, just maybe while you're um, uh, pinning stuff and, and whatever, um, is that some of the processes with this, uh, you know, the detection of black holes, you know, the measurement, like I say, with the, um, gravitational wave observatory where we actually measured uh, or LIGO was the first one to do it, but um, they, they measured coalescing black holes. So black holes that have actually merged, uh, they were able to measure that with laser interferometers. Um, those sorts of measurements and things like that are very accurate um and like say the measuring of like you know a, a jet or a pulsar or something like that like you can measure the frequency um to nine decimal places you know you, you can you can measure these things quite um exactly but when we're talking about black holes in the sense of like einstein rosen bridges um you know the possibility of white holes and you know what's on the other side of the singularity we have to say that we don't know <laughs> so we have to have a little bit of humble you know humble pie and kind of just say there's going to be some speculation in here and we have to just take it with a grain of salt because we we, we actually just don't know um and that's something i was chatting to my brother about the other day and he was saying you know there are there are things that you can talk about and that, that are known and then there are things which we can measure, but we don't actually necessarily know for sure the process that's going on. Yeah. I, but it's still fun, still fun to talk about. Uh, it is absolutely fun to talk about. I mean, like I said, at black holes at any, at any really, the level, hold on just a second. I think I got rugged. Did I get rugged? Uh, so I can still hear. Yeah, I think. Can you still hear? Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, I agree. Uh, you could we could take this in lots of different directions. And what kind of what I was thinking this time uh, is to talk is to talk about uh, just classical black holes. And, Schwarzschild uh, black holes. Yeah. Schwarzschild, uh, Newman, uh, Nordstrom. So all of those were basically, and then you have the collapsing star. And so, but like I was saying before, I, I want to start off with a, a quote from uh, Laplace. And I think this is awesome sure. because this is like right after Newton, right after Newton, uh, they were considering. So Newton has this idea uh, where the forces, uh, the gravitational forces uh, is proportional to the inverse square uh, of the distance. Yes. and directly proportional to the to the masses. And Newton's also uh, 
concerned. Uh, he, he's he's uncomfortable with having kind of action at a distance as well, and he was like, he's not saying what's the actual cause of the force. Right. Right. But uh, so, but he also proposes during the same time frame, he proposes uh, his uh, corpuscle uh, theory of light. And, and for those that are not familiar with it, uh, he makes the assumption that uh, light is a particle. And a little, a little later on, Raleigh was, uh, comes and says, no, light's a wave. We didn't have until, you know, 05 where Einstein's like, no, it's both particle and wave. Uh, but anyway, it's just interesting that how, how these things develop. And Laplace, uh, just using the laws of Newton, uh, Laplace and uh, Mitchell, uh, they were considering uh, stellar, uh, you know, stellar objects, and uh, and like I said, Newton does very, very well uh, to describe the uh, the motion of the planets, except for one in particular, Mercury, which will, you know, that comes back up. Uh, during Einstein's time, but uh, Laplace said, "Yeah, uh, so they." A luminous sorry, star... sorry to interrupt. So, sorry, did you, sorry, mate. Um, so that um, that point you made about Mercury. So that's that. The uh, is it the transition from Mercury the as it goes over yeah, yeah, the across the, the the sun, and right, they can so measure the like the elliptical. Uh, the elliptical orbit will shift. It's the perihelion motion of uh, of right. Mercury, right? So that's it's yeah. the it's the really the the one that's uh, you know. So we have special relativity in O five, and since just thinking about this, you know, O six on to nineteen fifteen, uh, to resolve uh, non inertial reference frames in the framework of uh, you know in, into the, to uh, attempt to bring gravity. Where the uh, the action of gravity is instantaneous in Newton, and we know that uh, it's not instant. You know, nothing could be like instantaneous with the forces uh, in special relativity. You know, you don't have faster than light travel. Sure. <clears throat> in Newton's in Newton's world, uh, he wasn't worried about uh, faster than light travel. But anyway, the quote was like. Uh, a luminous star of density uh, as the Earth, and whose diameter should be 200 and 250 times larger than that of the Sun, would, in consequence, uh, by means of its attraction, allow any of its rays uh, to arrive at a very possible large light, maybe uh, almost invisible. And so, basically, and I think this is a good example of of how you can use high school physics when you're first being introduced to physics, and you can start asking questions, and it may not be exactly right, but the underlying principles of physics will somewhat point the way to some illuminating truth. So if you follow uh, that line of course and say, well, we're going to make the assumption that light is uh, like a bullet, a particle, like Newton would. And uh, we're going to say that it, it originates from the, uh, from the horizon of the, this body that we're talking about. And so it all, has all gravitational potential energy associated with it. It, can't, it hasn't moved yet. And then at some asymptotic distance away, it's all kinetic energy. And you can then solve for uh, the radius if the velocity is the speed of light and you come up with R is equal to 2M uh, times the gravitational constant over C squared. Now, again, this is not- Is that the Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild radius? Uh, you can derive the Schwarzschild radius. That's exactly right. So you can derive the Schwarzschild radius from classical mechanics. It's not correct. 
And so the point right. that it's, but it emerges from it. So I'm like, physics points the way. You can, uh, because, well, like I said, the deepest principles in physics is correct. You know? Yeah, it's the, like, the inverse uh, square is the inverse square rule is is prevalent, and and it's there in gravitational. It's also there in um, with electromagnetic fields. Um, so yeah, when, that inverse square well, relationship is definitely there. Right. Well, the the uh, the the other other uh, point what is is that um, uh, it uh, uh, it's a pro it's an approximation of what the observation is. So outside of the outside of the massive gravitational potential, uh, then we have, uh, uh, you know, it's Newton becomes approximately correct. But anyway, so that, that's a, an interesting fact. And from now on, I'm going to assume that uh, the gravitational constant and the C are equal to to one when we're talking about these things. But I'm like, that's kind of like the art of physics, you know. I mean. So what principles are pushing us forward? Um, and so, uh, so then, uh, like, can... I like the way that, um, sorry, yeah. the, I like the way that um, cosmologists as well, is that we will take a, a factor and it might be like, you know, 900 million, uh, whatever, you know, and that will just be like, Oh, that's just, you know, 10 to the eight. <laughs> and you're like, no, it's nine times 10 to the eight. And you go, no, it's just 10 to the eight. Like we're talking orders of magnitude, like the scale that we're talking is so massive that we're not interested in the first digit. <laughs> we're just talking about right. the order of magnitude. Um, but yeah, so, so feel free, you know, to, you know, um, it, just approximate things and talk about, um, cause that's, that's very, I'm very used to that. Right, 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 right. Well, I mean, and the other thing I was going to say is, when are we talking about the inverse square relationship? Just so for the audience that who may not be like 100% au fait with some of this stuff, the inverse square relationship is just basically that, like, if you take away the uh, some of the other uh, uh, constants and things, that that the like the field will decrease proportional to the square of the distance that you are away from the source. So. Uh, like say with electromagnetics, you know, and you, you're talking about the electromagnetic field coming from a mobile phone cell tower, um, the, the the field strength, you know, or from your mobile phone, you know, it, the further away it is from you, that that field will drop off almost exponentially because as you as you increase the distance away from you, uh, it's the square of the distance. Um, that it, that's the rate that it drops off at. So that inverse square relationship is also there in gravitational and Newtonian gravitational, um, you know, classical gravitational. And then, of course, it gets expanded on and refined with relativistic gravity. Um, but that that that's that inverse square is is always there. Right. And so um, we'll fast forward a little bit, and you know, and. Like I said, 06, uh, one of the first, or 06 uh, to 11, uh, there's a breakthrough uh, in, in, you know, these, these things, uh, these things happen in, in leaps. And so uh, while pondering, uh, pondering equivalence, um, uh, he has a eureka moment, Einstein has a eureka moment where he basically realizes that uh, an accelerating reference frame is the same as a gravitational reference frame, er, and also that the masses, the inertial mass and the gravitational mass are equivalent. Now there's some uh, uh, debates about about this still, but uh, you know, Mach basically uh, uh, develops, you know, uh, the consequences of equivalency and so you go from a picture of of flat space time and so what do we mean by flat space time uh there's a pin there's a picture on the second tweet that i added to this this represents uh there's a p picture where it looks like a diamond that's flat space time <laughs> Uh, in in some coordinate system, and they uh, 
where the light rays are traveling at 45 degrees um, into the future. And then they're trying, they're going to be collected on a surface at asymptotic infinity. Uh, it's the light surface. Uh, the technical term for it is scry plus. It's the conformal boundary of Minkowski. So that's without presence of mass. It's not the presence without anything. Uh, and that's that constitutes flat space time. And it's a good approximation for things that are far enough away from the gravitational field. And special relativity uh, is uh, rules here. Anyway, yeah, that, uh, that's in interesting. 19... So, um, sorry, just go ahead. So, just again to re reiterate some of the uh, things that we the terms and things. So, um, when we're talking about special relativity and we're talking about um, uh, relativistic speeds, you know, approaching the speed of light, you get all sorts of weird phenomena that happens, like Lorentz and and um, and time dilation and things like that. And so, and with general relativity, it's more about how mass can deform space time, how gravitational fields can can dilate time. And, and so those things are um, accurately measured with like atomic clocks on the International Space Station versus on the ground, you know, because the, the atomic clocks, the way that they work with like, you know, cesium atoms decaying, you know, they have a very particular, you know, accurate uh, down to femtoseconds and things like that. So they, when they put those atomic clocks on fighter jets or on the ISS, which I think is traveling something like, you know, 30,000 kilometers an hour, or say about 17,000 mi 17, miles an hour, um, you know, the ISS is, is orbiting, I think the earth every 90 minutes. Um, and so it's going so fast that the clocks actually run slower uh, at that speed, but also it's gravitational, you know, the field, the act of the earth on those clocks actually affects it as well. So it's these relativistic equations that are proven through that sort of um, measurement that that sort of gives, you know, the credence to, you know, the, you know, these relativistic equations. Right. So uh, let's, let me pause there because I think this is a pretty important point. Um, so there are two main axioms in special relativity. Uh, the first one is that the universe is homogeneous isotropic. Homogeneous just means that if I translate whatever measurement that I may perform, uh, that the uh, that the measurements are the same, and so. And then it isotropic means I could look out into the into the universe. I could rotate my uh, coordinate system and obtain the same results. Also, that the uh, that the speed of light measured for all inertial reference frames are the same. And so this is the this is the changeover. This is why things happen. This is why that there is uh, no really no sense of of now. My now is not your now, right? Some yeah, things, yeah. Like, uh, like time, right. time is time is an illusion, albeit a persistent time's, one. <laughs> time's relative to the, relative. The measurement of time is relative to the observer. There's a local frame of reference, and uh, the local frame of reference is called proper time. That's what the uh, what's being measured by uh, one observer and two. Uh, independent observers have different times that can be that are functions of each other so you can make transformations back from one to another so that each can communicate so long that they're in uh, causal contact but uh but anyway so that's i think that's pretty uh it's important and and and, and the key is is that the invariant of the theory are uh, distances between these events so the distance between any event and uh, uh, we can perform these uh, transformations and each, everything that I'm discussing or uh, was describing is like 
event A, event B, we can map one to another. And if in one reference frame, if the uh, if the the distances between the events is uh, S, in the next coordinate system S prime, they're the same. And so, anyway, any questions? Yeah, I, I think uh, Strange Loop has actually got his hand up there. Hey, what's up, Strange Loop? Hey, guys. Uh, how do you say your name? Graviton, right? Oh, yeah, man. Graviton. How yeah. you doing, man? Uh, doing great. One second. Yeah. I'm just out for dinner, but I was listening to your conversations. Yeah. You I have a question. One second. Sorry. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, time in a, is an illusion, and, uh, you know, I was, I've, I've halfway through Carlos Ravelli's book, uh, Time, Time Doesn't <laughs> Exist, um, and, uh, I was just, I was just watching that last night, a, um, a, a thing with him in it, yeah, he's, he's, he's amazing. Yeah, he's amazing, and, um, so, even Leibniz, like, I was, you know, looking back in historical context, Leibniz believed in um, space being an, not an arena, right, where things happen. It's, it's the relation between the objects. And uh, so it's quite fascinating. We are coming like full circle about like our theories about space and time. And the fact that, uh, I mean, you guys are physicists. I'm just like, you know, amateur here. But the fact that like uh, black hole shows that space and time collapse clearly shows that they are it's not fundamental right like the more energy you put like at blanks uh, blank distances i mean the higher energies you put the bigger black hole you get i mean it's quite fascinating um it 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 is quite fascinating yeah. and that's a that's a great topic um uh, and definitely a rabbit hole. Uh, so the problem with time in, um, so Ravelli, what he is talking about is the fact that uh, the, there is no Hamiltonian. Uh, it's, gravity is a purely constraint system uh, from a, uh, from the Hamiltonian formalism, which basically means that there are no, that all of the degrees of freedom are uh, redundant. Kind of like uh, electric, electricity and magnetism, you have, uh, <laughs> you have degrees of freedom and then you have a constraint equation, um, which prevents, well, it's the reason that the photon only has two degrees of freedom. So two polarization vectors. Uh, Gauss's law is a constraint in uh, electricity and magnetism in, in the, like a field theory. And so when you're quantizing, how do you, how do you quantize, quantize um, a fully constrained system? Re, uh, Ravelli uses uh, Ashtakar's notion of uh, uh, spinner connections <laughs> and uh, and then you get uh, basically uh, a copy of uh, like a Yang Mills field, two copies of Yang Mills, uh, which map back onto the uh, the space. And then from that, he derives that um, space is uh, space time is quantized uh, in terms of area. Uh, there's a couple of problems with loop quantum gravity. So that was done in. Uh, you know, a lot of these mo those types of models are uh, done in uh, lower space times. And so with lower space times, uh, you know, obviously this is probably going way too deep. Uh, but the lower space times, uh, you can take care of some identities uh, a lot easier. In three plus one dimensions, it is very hard. And um, Thomas Tiemann in the early... 
uh, 2000s, 2005, 2006, as a grad student. I was actually studying this kind of stuff, so I'm, I'm very familiar with Tiemann's work. Um, and uh, Tiemann was working, uh, working towards uh, understanding what the, uh, the, the full uh, physical Hilbert space when you satisfy all the constraints. But there's some, uh, you know, when you have a discrete space time, when you're trying to demonstrate uh, a continuous symmetry, which is what we observe, we observe the continuum or a continuum approximation. And they were having, he said, they're still having difficulties with that. And, you know, that's what the progress of physics is. But anyway, yeah, so I, I'm like, the, even the existence, so even talking from a classical point of view, uh, the, the existence of these singularities, uh, you know, show that there's something inherently wrong. And there's other points of view, like in quantum, uh, there's um, defining what local observables are in the quantum field theory become difficult because then you say, well, we're, we're the protector and are you in an accelerated reference frame? And, you know, by the equivalence principle, that's the same thing. And so you end up getting a bath of thermal particles uh, because it's like Hawking radiation. It's called the Ur effect. Um, yeah, so I was just going to say one thing that um, that strange loop just to uh, that he mentioned about, um, about Carlo Rovelli, it like, so that idea that uh, we, we don't exist at, well, that particles don't exist in, a, in isolation and that only exist relative to their interactions with other particles. That is actually quite interesting. Um, and, you know, we were talking about entanglement last week and, uh, you know, you get this, this sort of role of the observer, which sort of, uh, uh, when you measure the spin state of one of those entangled photons or electrons, uh, it determines the spin state of the other. That's, that's kind of that, um, uh, that Ravelli's kind of idea where that he kind of talks about how, you know, like if you've got like the double split ex experiment and um, it's, it's, you can't really talk about uh, an electron in isolation, but where once you put in two slits, then all of a sudden it has a different interaction. So its interaction to, you know, a, another particle is different when there's an, another interaction with another particle. So you have to talk about this, uh, the context of the interaction. I guess that's that Ravelli thing that I think Strange Loop was sort of talking about. Um, and that the Hawking radiation thing that you were just saying, that's fascinating as well, because you get these virtual particle pairs, which kind of exist in the, the quantum foam, so to speak, where you have, say, electrons and positrons that, you know, that the particle antiparticle pairs that exist only because of the uncertainty in the energy and time. Like we were talking about the um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle last week and how there's always uncertainty in the, the position and the momentum uh, and measuring one affects the other and that the same happens with energy and, and time. So it, it gives rise to these virtual particles uh, in, in the vacuum or the vacuum energy effectively where you have particle antiparticle uh, annihilations that only exists for a small amount of time. And so that, that sort of quantum fluctuations are happening even in the vacuum. And then when you put those particle antiparticle uh, pairs that kind of exist only for a small amount of time and then annihilate, you put them at the event horizon of a black hole, one of them becomes real. <laughs> and then that's how you get that Hawking radiation that you can actually measure, which is, I think is quite fascinating. So I don't want to hijack, I'll, I'll go into listening mode, but I had another um, thing related to this and wanted to know what your viewpoints are. So non-locality, you know, mentioned quantum entanglement and non-locality is pretty interesting, right? So that does that indicate to that, and I'm not getting mystical, but like a universe which is kind of interconnected in a way so that like, you could you can have any object appear like 
it's into uh, like almost like a video game where you have coordinates like a mario can be in one co particular coordinate and then move to another coordinate um and i'm not talking fast yeah yeah like, no i, I see I see what you're saying in terms of particles. So particles that are entangled and then you move them to the other sides of the galaxy or whatever. And then, you know, you measure the spin state of one and then it directly instantaneously uh, determines the spin state of the other. You're saying like either if the two particles exist as one quantum state, then you're sort of saying that the particle is existing in two places in space time at the, or two places in space at the same time or that you've got some sort of you know faster than light communication maybe at a different dimension or some sort of no, wormhole no, no. between the particles yeah. is that what you're saying or no no multiverse garbage sorry sorry to say that <laughs> but like a universe like a, so th that's not testable right like all the string theory is definitely not what? testable yeah, there is a point where it becomes philosophy. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. And and that's what I was saying at the start of this space is like, once we, you know, you can measure quantum entanglement from the sense of, uh, you know, it's used in in qubits in um, quantum computers, and and uh, you know this is this is like well established. But the how and the why that is something that's still open for debate. So you know we can speculate. Um, you know, all sorts of science fiction stuff about multiverses and higher dimensions or, or, or whatever, some sort of consciousness between the, you know, these two particles, but that's pure speculation. All we know is that we can measure it and, and it's repeatable, right. but we don't really know why. <laughs> right. Uh, last question and then I'll, I'll shut up. I, I swear to God. One, another interesting question is, so then do you think, uh, so when Einstein, you know, has the time dilation, right? I mean, I feel like time dilation looks a little hokey now because if, you know, if you take time as a dimension, right, then you can say nothing, not, nothing. So you, nothing can move in the time dimension, like dv by dt, it's dt by dt it cancels out right so then nothing moves in the block universe can move in that no. in, in einstein's right no no i wouldn't say so that's true you have but, sorry go ahead you have, a, you have a set of of you have a time dimension associated with you and your world mind so every fundamental particle that you have is is going forward in it einstein's really talking about um my world line with respect, you know, in tr transformations from my coordinate system to another coordinate system. And what does that, uh, the observer in the other coordinate system say? Uh, what can he mm -hmm. say about it? And so his time uh, in, in a one reference frame is not my time in my reference frame, but I have a, uh, a way because I have the symmetries this global in, uh, symmetry that I can write a function from uh, my uh, my coordinate system to his coordinate system. So, whatever experiment that I may be performing, he can calculate and see if he if if I'm getting the correct or uh, he can perform the, the the experiment in his uh, coordinate system, and then we can communicate back and forth to say. Yeah, yeah, verily, this uh, physics is still invariant with respect to inertial reference frames, and so, mm. uh, and and so, yes, it, it's uh, so. The notion of proper time, and we're we're gonna, we're actually going to be talking about like uh, when uh, you are, if you have a, an exterior observer with someone falling into the uh, black hole. The exterior observer will say, did they ever cross the event horizon? And they'll say, no, right? That's what they observe because there's a, uh, it would take an infinite amount of time for the light to uh, the final crossover point uh, from the exterior observer. But the actual, the person that's falling into the black hole is actually will travel there in a finite amount of time. There's a finite travel time to the singularity. And 
all kinds of nasty mistakes. So it's not that you'll never fall into a black hole. You absolutely will. But the exterior observer will never observe you crossing over into the event horizon because the event horizon essentially is the uh, demarcation of what really defines that there is a black hole and there's an, a singularity that's a, 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 a source of infinite density <laughs> right. that has ripped rip, rip yeah. space time. Yeah. Yes. Oh, but um, 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 so the time dilation, then, I mean, I understand what you're saying, a different frame of reference or coordinates, right? Basically, I mean, it also shows that time is not fundamental, right? Or in some way, because it's... Sure, it, it's, it's elastic, yeah. Yeah, it's, it varies, right? And uh, There's no yeah, absolute so, time. Yes, you're right. I guess... There is no absolute yeah. time. That's the, that's right. the main... Uh, in, Newton, in, in Newton's world, he was like, all clocks work the same yeah. way. In um, all clocks work the same way, in in uh, Newton. Yeah, in Einstein was like, right. Newton's Einstein world. had the the advantage of of saying, okay, well, we have a, the electricity and magnetism, and we have uh, electromagnetic waves, which are solutions to Maxwell's equations. And then he can ask the question that re ask the question that he asked as a child. What if I was riding my bike as fast as light? What would what would I observe? And then there's the conflict. There, uh, there's the conflict between Newton and Einstein, where when you thought that Newton's laws were correct, and you look at the light, it's no longer a solution to Maxwell's equation. So something's wrong. Or something could be wrong. Yeah. Either Maxwell's Definitely. wrong or Newton's wrong. And so Maxwell in, 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 Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Newton, sorry to interject. <laughs> I I get excited on these discussions and sorry to oh, interject. No, I, mean, I, I don't want to interject real physics. physicists here, right? I, I, I'm going to look like an idiot if I do. Uh, what I was going to say is Einstein, uh, sorry, Newton's notion of. Uh, Time is inherent in the uh, inherent property of the universe was falsified for sure. I mean, that's, I mean, we can, we, we perceive time, maybe it's entropy in my simplistic terms, like it's the entropy of the universe that, that, that's oneness of the time, right? That, that gives its oneness, like the entropy, you know, yeah. increasing, yeah, increasing like, from, entropy, in, yes. entropy. Yes. Yeah. And uh, sorry, I forgot what my question was. The, the thing that gets me is the inertial motion. Where does that come from? Like body in motion continues to be in motion. Like I have never seen a, a very, um, a, like, like any explanation for that actually, to be honest. Well, so, okay, that's a great question. Uh, so a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force as Newton's first law. Uh, we got to be careful because we're about to say that Newton's wrong, but actually Newton's <laughs> right. This. this is this is inertial reference frame. All uh, the inertial reference, all inertial reference frames, uh, are equivalent, right? And what they see is now equivalent uh, as with respect to the speed of light. So the 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 uh, uh, so it's really mass. <laughs> it comes down to. Uh, that the the reason, the tendency, the general tendency to, to either stay in the same direction if you're moving or if you're standing still is because you have mass. If you have no mass, you're never standing still. Light has no mass. Right. Light is constantly moving. Uh, in respect to uh, time, there's no... There's no sense of passage of time with, uh, right? Because it and, means... and Penrose, I, I could go ahead and, and uh, we could talk about this a little bit more because Penrose is kind of uh, Roger Penrose is is, is is he he has a very interesting take on this. He was like, it's the it's the presence of mass that creates the clock because there is a relationship between. Uh, uh, I, Right. If you have momentum, uh -huh. you have a wavelength, which is associated with a, a wave. 
And so you have a sense of frequency. And so the presence of mass is creating the, the clock. So it's the mass, it's the mass of the object that's, that's giving it inertia. And this was, and this kind of goes back to what we were saying before is that Einstein has the, re the revelation that, hey, inertial mass and gravitational mass are the same. So that's the principle of equivalence. And that pushes, pushes Einstein beyond, uh, beyond the uh, special relativity. And now he can start talking about these non-inertial reference frames, which is the force applied to an object. You could talk you about know, forces. Yeah. You could talk well, about sources in special relativity, but you don't have a reference frame that's non-inertial. And, and so, this, sorry, uh, quickly, and and because I'm eating, and I'll end it. This is, yes, you're <laughs> right. Like uh, photons don't are massless because Higgs don't interact with uh, you know light particles, right? So Higgs particle give mass to everything. No, and, actually, well, that, no? yes, that's not true. It's sort of. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay, then I'm wrong. I'll it's, well, so it's, it's, it's 1%. Gravity still acts mass. on photons. Yes, gravity absolutely acts on photons. But gravity, yeah. it's because energy and mass are equivalent. There's an equivalency between the two. So uh, this can be a, the, uh, the, the, the origin of mass is a, uh, is, is a very interesting story. Uh, the, uh, the mechanism that the Higgs is, that given rise to a part of the mass of the universe is uh, things that are uh, interact with the electroweak field. However, the quarks interact with the strong field and there is, uh, there's another symmetry breaking that gives 99% of the mass of the quarks. So the vast majority of the mass in, of hadrons are, are coming from that symmetry breaking, not the Higgs. That only accounts for like a one percent, but that's a future topic. We don't have to get there. But yeah, maybe gravity, maybe don't go into Higgs bosons just yet. <laughs> right, gravity uh, actually. Uh, so, but gravity does affect the photon. It affects the yeah. Uh, it, it affects deflects, the wavelength. Right. It, it, it affects it, the wavelength. You, you can think of that as a wavelength. Path. Right. So, um, but that's the thing is so you know there's the de Broglie uh, sort of postulate that you can even have matter has wavelengths so when you're talking about um you know classical traditional uh gravity acting on mass it's kind of not really the way it works because you know you could gravity you see gravitational lensing of photons around galaxies for example that's proven you know so you, you see light getting deformed by gravity by mass so there is either you can think of it as a curved space time and it's actually deforming the space around it so that the path of the photon gets deviated or you can think of it as the gravity actually acting on the wavelength of the of the photon right and so anyway so we're uh, uh do you have any more questions Strang uh, strangely if your questions are great I am I think he's flattered. He's going to I mean, I, okay. so. Yeah, so one thing I was going to say about Strange Loop's thing was so he was saying that time dilation is a little bit hokey. I would argue that it is experimentally proven to one of the highest accuracies that you can, of any experiment. You know, that, that idea of putting atomic clock in the ISS and measuring, you know, the how the, how the time slows down um, you know, that's, so if you're, if you're comparing the relative time of, of a body at rest versus a, a body that's moving at tremendous speeds or has a different gravitational potential, you know, a clock at the top of a building will run slightly slower, oh, sorry, will slightly faster than, than the one at the bottom of the building. So it's just about your fidelity, your, your, your resolution, your, your accuracy right. of measurement. But that what, stuff is, is well, sort of height, well, height, well established. What I meant was... Height. Yeah, what I meant was uh, actually uh, uh, Graviton explained it like different. What I was trying to say um, uh, that time dilation, what I was trying to say is something, um, you know, uh, dictates that we have relative time in the universe, which, uh, yeah. which is not yeah, the case, correct. right? That's, that's, no, 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 uh, we have relative time. 
I mean, we do. What, what I was trying to say is like, um, yes, like, you know, compared to, I mean, everything depends upon the speed of light and, and, you know, anything cannot go faster than that, We, you know, and, and so what I was, well, maybe I phrased it totally differently. What I was saying is that when somebody considers time as a dimension, that is hokey because uh, that to me seems hokey because then nothing moves in that dimension uh, is what I was trying to get at. Like I see what so, you're saying. So it's yeah, but yeah. relative to relative to each particle, it has its own time dimension because the time can be is is right. malleable, is is elastic. Right. So it's yeah. I, I see. I kind of see. What, I think what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I said it the like the way I said it was correct. <laughs> All good, all good. No, we, you know, we encourage questions. Like we, you know, I think that's the thing is we want people to, you know, ask questions and to discuss it. I think it's interesting. Okay. So, 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 anyway, uh, so the, from the principle of equivalence, look, kind of going back, then we get the, the notion that uh the curvature is in some the curvature of space time is equivalent to the stress energy tensor which is a measure of the of how much uh energy is in a given area right and so this describes gravity that curvature is gra the gravitational the curvature of space time is the gravitational force and it's not really now a force it's just the curvature of space time, which again, this is a point that Ravelli will harp on and the loop quantum gravity people will harp on and saying, this is the, what you have to start out with that premise <laughs> that the principle, that the principle of, uh, uh, of equivalence leads to this road. And so this is the right, this is the right way. But then there was a guy by the name of Carl Schwarzschild, uh, in, I think they're in the war. Uh, World War One, soon after Einstein was uh, published, he's doing calculations on uh, ballistic tr uh, ballistic calculations, and he writes down a full solution and a full analytical solution of Einstein's uh, theory with no energy, <laughs> nothing. It's just a massive object, and that's called the Schwarzschild uh, equation. And what happens, going back to what we were talking about early on, where you, uh, Laplace came up with a, uh, an idea that the, uh, well, Laplace and Mitchell uh, showed that if you had a star whose radius was equal to two times its mass, then you had a star that had no light traveling out of it. And the same thing happens is in the short style equations. And if you look at the uh, diagram in, I guess Danny didn't like, doesn't like physics. <laughs> um, That's cool. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Top Gun was going to uh, say something if, uh, okay. if he's, uh, he had his hand up. I'm not sure if it's still there. Uh, well, I just had a question actually pertaining back to relativity. Um, because as much as Einstein laid the groundwork for relativity, he also poked fun at quantum physics with spooky action at distance. But meanwhile, we've had more than enough experimentation with observer effect, and I don't even completely understand the experiment they did um, uh, to, to really yield the results. But um I understand the gist of it and the basics. And so when I do some research into the Albuquerque white drive, um, where they're working on using vacuum tubes and magnetic coils to produce warping in, in space time, um, condensing the actual space curvature. So shortening the distance between point A and point B, the problems they've run into in experimentation show that as they try to reach faster uh, speeds, like approach the speed of light, the drive in, or at least in theory, I'm not sure if it's in practice because they're playing around with little models of these, but they tend to build up 
more Hawking radiation. I think it's in theory because they were working on setting out a uh, actual experimental model of this, but the Hawking radiation, they were surmising it was a part of quantum entanglement, uh, basically messing with the relativity of uh, time. So I was wondering how, if, I'm not, man. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, we, we were talking about quantum entanglement last week, and, and if you haven't heard of that, we, you know, we went into that quite at depth. Um, that's really interesting uh, about that particular drive. Like, um, but Hawking radiation is generally about the, the virtual particle uh, sort of annihilation that happens, whereas entanglement is slightly different. Um, it is related, though. Those particles are entangled as they go. I mean, and so they, they, main, they do yeah. maintain. So it's non-local in the respect that it's, it's not, uh, yeah, anyway. I mean, there's a, that's a very uh, deep subject. And as far as like the Albuquerque drive, it, it's also a solution to Einstein's field equations where you have a massive object, you know, a massive source source of mass so and then you uh boost you boost that mass uh by some uh lorentz transformation so you figure out how to move it and you essentially are moving <laughs> space time with it and so i mean those are that is a pretty theoretical um work but ag again if you have that and you've created this uh you will uh if it if the source is massive enough it will excite the quantum vacuum and you will see uh, this is what the, that ur effect that i was talking about where you have a thermal bath of particles that, that are around but again uh, th that's very very theoretical oh look man i i think warp drives are awesome i think that's a very cool uh you know um idea and i i haven't heard much about that um Albuquerque drive or whatever. So, if uh, Top Gun, if you can send me a link, like just DM me, man. I'd like to hear more about it because, you know, it is kind of fascinating to think about if we are going to try and become, you know, interplanetary and uh, we want to sort of traverse the galaxies and things like that. To be able to travel at even the ultimate speed, it's going to take, you know, hundreds of thousands of light years just to get across our. Oh, th hundreds of thousands of years just to travel across our Milky Way, and obviously it's just not not uh, tenable. <laughs> so, well, we we you know this idea of warping space and warp uh, wormholes, you know, I think you know we should be discussed more. And I'm all for warp drives, and I'd love to learn more about it. Well, um, I actually have done a lot of studying on the subject, so I'll dive off for a moment and go seeing if I can f do a little research to find a relevant link. Uh, it's the Albuquerque White Drive because it refers to the two scientists. Uh, how about we let Strange, uh, Strange Loop go ahead and ask his question. I'll see if I can reference some information, and I can give you guys a little rundown on the history of this and why it's not as theoretical as you may think. Could be good, man. Yeah, interesting. Like, yeah, why not? You know, I want to say, though, uh, with that uh, talk, we were, what we mentioned about instantaneous, um, you know, one object appearing in instantaneously with coordinate, coordinates, like imagining, you know, Mario Brothers in a video game. Uh, you won't need warp drive uh, travel, right? Because then imagine like all these sci-fi movies which show like, okay, you're having warp drive. I mean, the object could be just instantaneously at one place. Uh, uh, if, if, if does that, you know, these things are entangled and they are like, you know, exist in this single universe. Uh, any thoughts on that? Like, because we won't even need I think rock, there's, rock there's limitations. Yeah, there's limitations to that uh, entanglement idea. I mean, that that the information, you, you know, is not necessarily traveling um, instantaneously between these two particles. But the, the, the warp drive thing, I think, you know, the idea of that is kind of like when you, if we were to bring it back to black holes, is that, you know, that they are warping space and time and, and, 
it, it does get to the point where you can postulate if you have, you know, there's there's things like curved black holes, like rotating black holes, where they talk about if you were to traverse the singularity rather than just getting spaghettified, is there some way that you could use that as a Einstein-Rosen bridge to travel to, uh, you know, another multiverse and, and things like that. So those sorts of science fiction ideas, we, we don't really have any answers for, but they're, they're still fun to talk about. Yeah, and the energies required would be enormous too, right? That's another thing that to warp that, it's enormous amount of energies. Right. I mean, I'm warping space time. I'm moving. I'm creating. Uh, now, to first order approximation, it, it doesn't. I'm not doing anything because I'm in Earth's gravitational field. But I'm. Yeah, you know, exactly. I move yeah, every Earth, I'm creating. Everybody is, uh, you know, warping space time uh, with some risk in, in uh, you know, if you can, and, if you can that's, measure. That's super that interesting. Level. Yeah, that's super interesting because, you know, we were talking about gravity waves before and I was saying about how we could measure the, like LIGO, for example, could measure the, the coalescing black holes, the, the ripple in, in, in the fabric of space-time. Space but so the, I kind of think of this like as analogous to, you know, Marconi putting the, you know, the first electromagnetic, you know, plane wave across, you know, the ocean to try and send some signal. And we're sort of going, I wonder what we can do with this. And now we're just using you know time division multiplexing protocols for on mobile phones to to transmit data there might be a point where if we can figure out how to modulate gravitational waves and send information even at a and well really we have to be able to detect them more sensitively um we need to increase our sensitivity of of um of gravitational wave measurement then if we could modulate these gravitational waves even at small masses we could transmit data um, and that could be another spectrum to actually uh, communicate with. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the background, uh, the the yeah, the background's pretty, pretty tricky to kind of get around. But perhaps I mean that's an engineering problem. <laughs> Here's another thought. Can we describe uh, gravity in terms of light? Sorry, ah. my dog is here. We, we we're we're not in terms of light per se. But you could talk about the motion of light with respect to it in in a gravitational field. But that's one of the things that I was trying to uh, bring across is that the really the fundamental object in in, uh, in special relativity is the the distance between events, and and so we we said that the uh, that the curvature of space time is somehow the is gravity, and that's equivalent to the uh, the amount of energy in a given area. Or the stress and the pressure, uh, density, the presence of mass and density, uh, or pre and pressure uh, that gives rise to gravity. But it's what? always in terms of. Uh, and so, what do you say about curvature? Well, there's a sense of measurements of distances, right? And so, the fundamental unit is still. I'm talking about uh, distances between events. And that's so that's that's the real the connection between the two is the fundam is uh, the fundamental thing that you're looking for is how do I describe distances in space time and that could be on a curved manifold like uh, well an example of a curved space would be the like the globe it's a two it's a two dimensional object but it's curved uh, a plane is a flat. You know, that's an example of a flat two manifold. So is a torus. A torus is a flat two dimensional manifold. Uh, so anyway, uh, so you generalize, you can generalize that up to, to three special dimensions in one time dimension. And you can describe uh, curvature in terms of, well, the, the curvature is, is really telling you how far that the light is traveling. Because light will always take the shortest distance in yeah, so it's, it's like field. it's like the curvature. So it's like the curvature is gravity. That that's kind of what yes. you were saying as well. Exactly, the curvature is gravity. But how do you quantify that? And 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 so there's a, a, these uh, those equations uh, are, are uh, nonlinear <laughs> partial differential equations, 
And so uh, they give rise to, you could solve them for various initial conditions and uh, various energy terms. But anyway, go ahead. Oh, no. So what I was thinking is this, that we also have an anomaly with matter and antimatter, right? The amount of matter does not equate to the antimatter, which you was propose, proposing. So what I was thinking yeah. is, is that, does that have a relation to gravity given, uh, like if we follow the law of conservation of energy, maybe it's a violation as a result, gravity is a result of that. Like no, it's that, it's more fundamental. No. I mean, it's no, it, it okay. doesn't have to. So okay. the uh, the asymmetry of uh, uh, that's antimatter. Problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The asymmetry between matter and antimatter is something different. The mat uh, antimatter uh, just has the, it has the same mass, but the different the opposite charge, right? So it doesn't have negative mass. Negative mass doesn't make. Uh, yeah, yeah, not like the mass. What I meant right. is, uh, uh, like, um, I feel like gravity, I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, um, pitballing here. I mean, uh, just brain farts for me right now is, um, like, gravity, well, I'll leave that thought for later on. I, I was thinking maybe it's, there is a violation of, law of conservation of energy and as a result you have because you know gravity is non-local right so it's every like it's it's in the universe so that non-locality of gravity oh no it acts has, locally gravity acts locally no but what i was saying is like it varies Local. locally but like it's uh, by non-local i meant like it's it's it, it's everywhere is what I was trying to get at. Well, in, in that respect, the, all quantum fields are everywhere. Right. Uh, but it's not necessarily uh, the action of gravity is locally defined. Yes. Action, action is locally defined. Yes. Correct. The action is. And so there's the distinction uh, between that and we we're talking about entanglement like, uh, that, you know, those two particles are actually the same in some respect. <laughs> they're the they're the same until the wave function. There's a measurement, and the wave function collapses. And it collapses, yes. Right, and but that but the object is the same because it was prepared and and it was coupled in the beginning in the preparation yes. state. Uh, so that's the fundamental difference. And uh, but when you say gravity is uh, local, there are theories that gravity acts non-locally, but those don't really match observations. Uh, that we have seen so far. There's an effort, uh, there's been efforts to modify, there's something called MON, and it continues to stay around, it stays around, lingers around, which is modified Newtonian dynamics. And this is why I don't invite my friends to, to these spaces, because they're like, I can't believe you're talking about MON. <laughs> <laughs> Let it die. Um... <laughs> I just saw before that Top Gun had his hand up. So just uh, if he wanted to chat. Well, yeah, I went digging and found at least uh, one relative article to the uh, Albuquerque Drive. And, uh, yeah, I love diving into this stuff because, like, it starts to present so many questions. So, I mean. I can't hear Top Gun. Is it me? Oh, am I right? Yeah, you might have to exit and then come back in, man. Okay, yeah. Okay, Oh, so it's not me, right? Okay. Um, so anyways, Go ahead. finding this interesting, I still come from a layman perspective and probably more of an engineering perspective. Um, I have a working understanding of mechanics that allows me to mechanically kind of understand the universe, and I love how it gets thrown off by, me, by quantum physics. But anyways, following uh, the Albuquerque drive, like I get the names mixed up between who's who with Albuquerque and White, but... One of them was the theoretical physicist that in 2001 published a paper about how theoretically you could use a magnetically charged vacuum coil or vacuum ring to generate a gravitational force and exotic particles in order to warp space. But the model itself uh, required roughly the energy requirements of, I think, something the size of Jupiter, which is outrageous and unusable. But then... 
bless the engineer, when we get to 2011 or 2010, uh, NASA commissioned, I think it was white, uh, to surmise a bunch of the proposed uh, space travel technologies and try and illustrate which ones were more feasible, why, why not. But he was working as a private contractor wonderfully at the time. Now, what he did with it was took the engineering mind to it and went, hmm, there's basically one giant vacuum tube donut on this thing. And, uh, well, let's put it in AutoCAD. And I wonder what happens if we add a second one. Make it like four-wheel drive instead of two-wheel drive. Whoa, the energy requirements drop to roughly like the size of Earth? Whew, that's a big change. Well, what if we uh, what if we do another change? It shouldn't matter at all because it's space. But you know, airplane wings have a certain dynamic. So what if we shape the donut into more of a ring shape and elongate it like a round airplane wing? Oh, look at that! The energy requirements drop to the size of the moon. Um, then applying some more. Well, hey, right now it's uh, it's still direct current. It's like a big cruise liner dragging through the water. What if we just put AC through this and put it to alternating current? So it's more like accordioning the space so it can ride like a ski do on the top of the waves. Oh, the energy requirements dropped to something like the size of a Buick. Like as they added, as the scientists added these different aspects, um, boom the energy requirements became a lot more practical so by 2015 i was following and they had actually successfully with a tabletop version of this operating on something the size of four feet by eight feet with lasers managed to technically because you can't make light go faster than light so they shortened the distance because the light got to its destination at the sensor faster but they still weren't sure of their their results so they put it out to a few different universities hoping to get debunked and all of them had slightly different results, but all of them confirmed that basically the light got there sooner, um, that this thing might actually potentially work. And it was at that point, this information kind of started to disappear a little bit from the internet. And it was like, it got talked about a lot less, but the last bit of digging I found was they wanted to build something basically like a Dixie cup, uh, model size, like your red solo cup, um, and put it in space and see if they could actually get it to work. There's still some debate about whether it would actually generate its own propulsion by shortening space or if it need to be used in conjunction with something like an ion drive. But that's where, like, in studying it, at that point, they were finding the Hawking radiation was a bit of an issue, which brings me to, like, the whole entanglement with quantum physics. I mean, the universe is so bloody hokey because as I understand it, like, one of the theories I love subscribing to is the single electron theory, because the electron acts as a particle in a wave. But what if electricity is actually a wave, as we understand it traveling through universe and time with us from the Big Bang? And if that's the case, it literally materializes into an electron to balance the equations and perception we have of the universe we're observing. So it appears when needed as observed, but not actually there. Like, some of the stuff that I hear is so interesting. I'm like... I don't know how to properly perceive that. Yeah. So well, the, John, the single that... the single electron thing is is it kind of comes out because of the the quantum mechanical description of like a Schrodinger a, a wave uh, a, a quantum state being defined over like from negative infinity to positive infinity. So it's it's defined over all space, but it has a probability of existing. So the, those those things are interesting. Um, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that uh, that was popularized by uh, John Wheeler <laughs> uh, about the uh, in the forty when uh, Feynman was a, uh, a grad student of his uh, in the late thirties, early forties, uh, and uh, and yes, you're right. It did come from the notion of quantum uh, from the Dirac equation, and but the pro the thing is is that the Dirac equation doesn't describe a single a uh, single electron, it, it describes a, uh, a field of electrons, that the, there's an actual field. It, so the, the interpretation, while the Dirac equation is correct, um, which is, is basically the relativistic uh, wave equation uh, for fermions, uh, while the Dirac equation is correct, it doesn't describe a single, uh, single electron. So that that interpretation of that equation uh, has been subsequently modified. And, and the electromagnetic field is a wave. 
and a particle, but the the excitations are both. Yeah, and uh, um, anyway, I'll so, just so gonna... it's not surprising. Let me uh, actually, this is related to this uh, uh, what we were going to talk about, uh, perhaps another day. But uh, uh, it's related to uh, the this notion of the black the the black hole and the classical black hole and the properties that they can maintain uh, that they can possess. A black hole can have mass. It can have spin in the form of angular momentum, and it also can have charge. And if you have charge, you have a presence of an electri uh, electric field. And if it's moving, that electric field induces a magnetic field. And so it's not, it would not be surprising, it shouldn't be surprising to the theoretical physicists that, uh, that you can essentially reduce the amount of uh, mass energy that you would need to create such a drive. Uh, I'm like, it shouldn't be a surprise. And that in itself, and there's a joke, there's a uh, joke in the, uh, in my, uh, and those are essentially the classical uh, degrees of freedom that a black hole can have the properties. And Wheeler made the statement, a black hole has no hair. <laughs> and so that hasn't been proven, the full general conjecture hasn't been proven, but it has been proven that uh, that those are the three. Those are three. There could be more, but those are the only known three yeah. for classical. So uh, the charge, the charge, the angular momentum, and the mass, and that's the way to right. to look at that. What we can determine, and then so, right. yeah, there is this. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. But there, there is a, that that sort of black. Uh, that sorry, no hair conjecture thing. Uh, has implications um, of, you know, the information paradox um, because whether whether that information is preserved in um, when, when, it, when a black hole, when matter is getting uh, sucked into a black hole, but black holes can evaporate, right? So they, once they, they can actually, well, so then there's a there's information paradox there as well. Well, because the black holes have entropy, right, and that they radiate, uh, that there's well, a the Hawking property to is it, sort of... right? The yeah. thermal radiation is an indication that eventually the state of the black hole will uh, not exist, and so the question is, is whether or not the the amount the the wave functions of the items that or the objects that are preserved uh, that were absorbed into the from the event horizon. What happens to that? And that's the information paradox. And it's still an ongoing yeah, exactly. discussion. I mean, I think we're going to need quantum, uh, a full quantum gravity, the correct full quantum gravity. And, we can yeah. answer this. So, I mean, unless, the, see, that information might actually be in the Hawking radiation. It's just, a, it, it, it somehow would have to be de deciphered. Well, the Hawking radiation, <laughs> right. So, the Hawking radiation is, is a very, is a high entropy in energy. So uh, this is a good, I don't know, this is really, this is actually a really good discussion. So if you're, let's look at the sun, okay? The sun radiates a certain amount of energy onto the earth. And then what does the earth get out of it? And how much energy, so, and then uh, that energy is uh, diffused out in the sun. So the earth essentially uh, radiates the heat, right? How much, what's the, what's the equivalency? It's almost one-to-one. -one. So the, inner, the, uh, uh, so the amount of, uh, so the earth actually receives low entropy energy, usable energy. And then because energy is uh, uh, converted, it's actually converted to a higher in entropy, which means it's unusable. So the black hole is the, the biggest source of entropy in the entire universe. So it, it, anytime that it's radiating, it's a completely useless energy. And so whenever it, it fully exhausts uh, it, its, uh, you know, its lifetime, whether or not that there could be anything that you can get out of it is the real mystery. Yeah, uh, so uh, then um, everything goes to, you know, uh, 
well, everything, the, the heat depth of the universe, right? Uh, uh, entropy increases, and that's 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 the fundamental, uh, you know, kind of law that the universe sort of follows. Where well, I was going with potentially, this, I, potentially. I mean, there, there, that's yes. conjecture. Also, there's right. conjecture about there's a uh, Suskin uh, was uh, in his in a team mm -hmm. of. Uh, uh, physicists were, or, or actually, they're computer scientists, uh, and there's a layer onto the randomness that a black hole has. And so the question was about the qubits that, the entangled qubits that, that enter into the black hole, being able to increase the entropy of the state, and this is why that the uh, the volume uh, continues to increase, that the uh, the measure of com of complexity of those states. Yep. Uh, so did, does that uh, sorry quickly uh, does that, that does that has to do anything with say um, you know the Maxwell Demon experiment where in order to restore order the demon has to kind of uh, maintain the state of each and every particle hence you're looking at this infinite store like storage of information um, so then the question is, where does the universe store that sort of information? I've never quite understood that. Like if, if, uh, but you know, clearly it's like the entropy, uh, you know, from it's spreading out, right? So it's, it's becoming larger and larger. Uh, clearly that, that, that the infinite memory requirement to like arrange or give orders to things is, is not it cannot be sustained. Uh, does that make sense or because? Sorry, I was doing something. <laughs> um, oh, okay. uh, Graviton, did you have, did you hear that? I, I heard most of that. Uh, uh, storing that information. So that's at a very, yeah, I, that's a question that's, you mean like the 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 overall entropy? So the entropy is a measurement of the disorder of the information in the universe, right? right. I mean, so if you look at the total entropy, uh, it's a measure. So it, everything is trying to reach some maximum, and so the the general tendency, uh, again, this is this is not the only idea for the arrow of time. There are others. Uh, this is something that's been popularized by uh, Sean Carroll uh, and uh, and others. Some believe that uh, the the arrow of time is uh, just a uh, just an axiom. But uh, he uh, Carroll makes the uh, claim that the the overall entropy is, of the universe is, is which is like I said the measure of the disorder of the information in the universe is reaching a maximal state where everything will become in thermal uh, equilibrium with one another. And then at that point, you could have Poincaré uh, recurrences where uh, you'll have these, yeah, I, I don't really want to go into that. It's, it's, it's yeah, very I, interesting. I think that's sort of a little bit off topic, isn't it? Um, but the, the entropy of the, these black holes, I mean, it, it is interesting when you sort of look at the scale of these, um, like some, like, so, you know, you can get supermassive black holes with, uh, you know, millions and billions of, of solar masses. And, um, and so the, some of the actual diameters are pretty scary. And I would encourage people to actually look up, you know, animations or, or uh, even just looking at the scale, like, so, an astronomical unit from the earth to the sun, you can have some super ma supermassive black holes that have Schwarzschild radiuses in the order of, you know, hundreds of astronomical units. So if you can mentally picture like just how big some of these things are that, I mean, of course you can get black holes and things like that. Um, th there's been some, you know, postulation about micro black holes and, and and things like that but in terms of the ones that we can that we can measure uh some of them are just tremendous in size and scale oh, uh, well yeah so the the microbike i mean uh, so what you 
we were talking about earlier was the uh, if you had a, a Planck energy uh, photon that's interacting within a Planck within the distance of a Planck lens, so something ten to the nineteenth GeVs in uh, in a uh, region of space that is uh, ten to the minus thirty four uh, centimeters, if there's some level of interaction. You know by uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle that to uh, in order to probe smaller and smaller distances, you need higher and higher uh, momenta to do so, you would actually create a black hole. And so space itself is those micro black holes, which would evaporate, but they hide the very foundational piece of the, uh, the puzzle that you're trying to, to understand. And so- yeah. Yeah, as if uh, the universe has a speed limit, right? Like or or limitation, because if you put more energies, you get a bigger black hole, right? Right. Smaller, hey, well, smaller, smaller space. Smaller, yeah, yeah. So it, high density. Poten yeah. Potentially, I mean, we don't know. I mean, so that's right. That's again, that's the real the real problem with quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, in uh, trying to apply it to quant uh, to uh, to the gravitational field, is that hundred uh, percent. How you cannot define? I mean, how, defining local uh, local observables, which is the only thing physics is really about, <laughs> is you can't define them, and so you have to start thinking, try to figure out, out, you know, think outside the box on what's really happening, and and is there any underlying principles? And you know, there are some, and I and I am one of those people that actually believe that physics is kind of pointing in in some direction. Oh. Um, I think Top Gun also had his hand up as well. Sorry, man. Oh, no worries. Like, this conversation is, like, wonderfully a bit above my head, and I love it because uh, usually I feel like the huge physics buff. Um, but I actually had a question back pertaining to the, uh, the usefulness of energy because of the entropy of the black hole. So the, basically that it's non-usable. Um, cause the entropy overrides the energy production at the, at that rate. But, uh, I think it was James Webb telescope recently. I was reading something where it described, uh, essentially a fart from a black hole as it managed to erupt at least some neutrinos, maybe some matter. Um, and so at that point, the energy production obviously outpaced the entropy in that case, which would suggest there's still a lot of unstable, uh, activity going on inside the black hole. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that. So I, that's, I think that's two different related issues. Uh, so when I'm, when I'm talking about the, uh, the overall entropy, am I, am I muted? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Sorry. I, um, one second. Uh, so, uh, two, two, two things. Um, uh, so the entropy that I'm discussing is just solely based on the uh, Hawking radiation uh, of, uh, of the black hole. The observable, uh, there are jets that form because, again, magnetic fields that are produced by the electric charge of the black hole. So if a black hole is charged, you're going to get uh, these uh, jets. And so there, that's the energy that they're uh, Hello, brother. potentially useful. Hello, brother. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. How are you doing? Doing great. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Return, I, I, I had a question. So, um, what I was going to ask is, um, oh, geez, what the hell? I kind of forgot. Yeah. Uh, um, Ooh. Um, this was regarding black holes only. So um, the higher the and the more energy you put in a smaller state. Oh, sorry. The bigger question I wanted to ask is, what are laws? Maybe I'm I'm touching the philosophical space a little, but like at a at a higher level, right? At a at a macro level, I think your mic is on, Graviton. Uh, so at a higher level, um, like at a macro uh, level, um, laws are something like what I'm trying to 
say is like at the quantum state, like you have completely different sets of laws. Uh, and then they break down uh, or they become uh, like our laws as a result of combination of what is at the lower level and that it remains consistent like at the higher level. I mean, are the, is that what a law is? And then then the That's... question is, then the question is if we get violations of the law all the time and then uh, in order to balance that the universe like does what it does i okay so i i would sort of object to that slightly um okay. because it implies some sort of consciousness there but no, no, it, no, where no, it doesn't no, no, where no, it doesn't no, need no, to no. be but 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 no i just mean like where where we where we do not need to insert that where where could where it can be explained otherwise but um but i do think yeah it is interesting from a philosophical point of view to um, to think about the laws and why why are these laws repeatable and how, how can we can measure them and and their interactions but one one theory is that you can have say you know if you had multiple universes right say for example and this is a bit science fictiony but if you had uh black holes that sort of had a, a white hole on the other side. So if you had infinite gravitational attraction uh, taking in matter and then spewing it out the other side into uh, a white hole, that creates effectively like a big bang and it creates another, another universe. In these other universes, the laws could be different to the laws of our universe, right? So you may not have the fact that entropy always increases. You may not have conservation of energy. You may not have, you know, electrostatic uh, uh, repulsion and things like that or attraction. So, and in these universes, you don't get particles forming, galaxies forming, particles forming, you know, si systems, uh, stable orbits, and you don't have life forms that can ask the question why. <laughs> So it is possible and, and that we are a result of a, uh, a, a series of uh, uh, laws, so to speak, that have come about. Um, and, but in other multiverses, these laws may be different and they have different dynamics. And then there is no one there to sort of question why, because it's just all one giant plasma <laughs> or, you know, right. so that's one, anyway, that's one uh, idea. You know, then another thing that I think Graviton or you both of you mentioned is the um, entropy could is explained by say sorry time is explained by the by entropy increasing right. Uh, then what what is could be the possible second? I, I don't uh, think that I I'm going to refute that. I just oh, on, okay. Uh, one, a little second, bit. one second, Graviton. One point I had is. The second thing I was thinking is that then how do you explain causality? Like, is it the um, occurrence of one event and then the subsequent event happening? Like in terms of, uh, like in the cosmos, does causality is there or is it the figment of our imagination? So yeah, those two questions. Sorry, guys. Okay, so first thing. Uh... Entropy is only needed for the arrow of time, so that the universe. Uh, so the conjecture is, and this is purely conjecture. There's no proof that at an earlier state in the universe, the universe had a uh, substantial, uh, a le smaller entropy was in a smaller entropy state than it is today. It's just a a way that we get things progressing forward in time. The causal structure of the universe that causes, uh, you know, that affects follow causes, it is purely special relativity. That's the causal structure of the universe is, 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 is the fact that the speed of light, you have no, no transformation of information faster than the speed of light. Mm. And so those, those are two fundamentally different things. One is particularly talking about, and the reason that that's important is because you can talk about uh, in special relativity, as far as like the arrow of time, 
the laws of physics are invariant. We say the laws of physics are invariant with respect to uh, with respect to time. So uh, the physics forward and physics backwards is the same, but we know that in the reality it's not because we have events that are uh, irreversible. If I drop an egg onto the floor, uh, I've moved from a, I, I can't reverse that. If I were to look at that process, it, you know, in reverse, it would not look the same as if it were proceeding forward. So the, in, there, so the, the, the measurement of the disorder of that system goes from a low, low entropy state, low disorder to high disorder when it's splattered on the floor. So those are two different things. Right. So then there was, I think, Carlos Vivelli had an ex thought experiment. Like, you know, if you look at a picture and nothing changes, right? Changes is actually the perception of arrow of time. Like, or, uh, you know, in a universe where nothing moves or no, nothing, no change is happening, there's no entropy unfolding, then you won't have this arrow of time, right? It will be what, like a stale, you know, I don't know what the word is. It's just a, uh, so, static. so that's yeah. static, yeah, static or stale or whatever. Um, I don't know what the scientific, I mean, you guys are physicists, so you, you know. I mean, that clearly explains to me, I, I think you're pointing to art, that it might, it's just the change in events, whether it's, entropy that enables that i mean seems like thermodynamics works on that principle or, or anything like any a combustion engine or all the machines we have built sort of work on that principle uh but yeah that change if if uh, i think they did a bose einstein condensate right where they were able to completely freeze like like yeah so all, yeah. yeah so th with the bose einstein concept so that's like if you have like liquid helium and then it's it exists in a single quantum state and then um you know if you give it kinetic energy then it can it wants to go to a lower potential energy state right and, and yes yeah that's that's another state of matter uh, though to be fair like so that's like you know solid liquid gas plasma and bose einstein condensates um, that's that is, but interestingly enough, they have just there's some article recently they're talking about um, superconductors at room temperature, and and so I'll be interested to see how that how that plays out. I I think strangely that you're talking about there's a uh, a crystal that uh, uh, that uh, they were calling it a time crystal, in which the uh, which essentially uh, was an the crystal does not uh, there's some level of where the Hamiltonian basically is a Hamiltonian equals zero type of thing, where uh, the passage there's no time, measurement of time within the crystal, and that they were constructing these. I mean, those are very exotic type of uh, experiments, and it's out somewhat up. It's outside of my uh, area of expertise, but I I certainly read those type of papers. Yeah, there is another scientist, uh, there's a British scientist that talks about time. He has a book, um, man, I'm forgetting his name, Julian something, Barber, Barber, Julian Barber. I think his uh, concept of um, time is interesting too. Like I've uh, I've seen some of his work. Uh, I, I, I also, I mean, so this is, this is kind of, uh, you know, we, you're kind of hitting on the um, the reason that we've decided to start having these spaces where we could talk about physics on a more uh, technical level, and and try to keep it where we can bring in analogies and things of that nature, is that sometimes physicists have the over <laughs> when they're trying to popularize their work, and so you'll say you know, you'll see these things that will say well space time is doomed. Okay, well, what does that really mean? Or gravity, there is no gravity, which then the people, the flat earth people will take oh, yeah, and yeah. say, there look, 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 uh, yeah. There, yeah, there's absolutely good. gravity. But, but yeah. what they're talking about is like emergent properties of, of right. uh, the universe. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, <laughs> they're not really saying what they think that they're saying. <laughs>
Yeah, so. like when Nima Hamid said uh, space time is doomed in his lecture, he he specifically mentioned that there might be. I mean, they cannot verify right now that there is something more fundamental that the space and time emerges out of that, right? So yeah, you're exactly right. That right when I they mean, see we, yeah yeah we don't know what the quantum like I said we don't know what quantum. Uh, what quantum gravity really looks like. We have some ideas, we have some right. thoughts, uh, but we have no data. And so, and the, the without the presence of data, you know, physics kind of goes and scratches its head and, and gets lost in the wilderness for, uh, for 40 some odd years. So, yeah. uh, and, and there's, there's all sorts of paradoxes as well and in, in physics. And, and I think that's why, you know, it can be quite fascinating to delve into these paradoxes because, you know, that's where, he, so when Einstein had his field equations and then Schwarzschild comes along and says, oh, look, there's a, there's a solution for these field equations where you have these infinities <laughs> and this is in like, you know, the thirties or something. Um, and then, but it's not until quite, quite a bit later that we start to measure these things. So looking at paradoxes and stuff, I think is a good way to kind of realize that we're actually you know, as humans, we're, and we're trying to characterize uh, uh, the world around us, we're only really using what we can to approximate reality. You know, we're only, we're only using the tools we have available, the mathematics we have available, um, and, and, and there's inherent biases with that. So um, our approximation to reality can get refined over time, uh, and, but sometimes it's like looking at these paradoxes that kind of makes you do it a leap to the next level. Um, there was someone with their hand up there. I can't see. Oh, Gordon. Go to <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Not a physics guy. I'm <laughs> not anything really, but cubics, uh, they can be in opposite states in any distance, the way I understand it. Do you believe that we'll be able to have long-range communications through that? No. Okay. No. Uh, so, uh, well, qubits in particular, I mean, uh, I'll let uh, Doza uh, uh, speak on this as well. If you had communication proper, uh, proper communication uh, regarding that, it would, in, in essence, be faster than light uh, communication. That's not what's happening. There's also the problem of decoherence. And so these qubits have to be, uh, the, when, they're perform uh, when they are super cooled for the use in like a supercomputer, uh, it, there's a, they have to be maintained in a way that they are not interacting with the exterior environments. But uh, when you start talking about, uh, well, I'm going to use that notion, to, while it's theoretically possible to uh, talk about the qubit, uh, qubits that are uh, further away, or I would, what's called space, time, uh, space like separated. Uh, and I can make a measurement here and it collapses the wave function here uh, at the other place, A and B. I have no way to communicate that this is indeed the result. I'm just going to have to take it on, you know, mathematical uh, faith. So there's no real communication happening between the two locations that are space like separated. So that's that's impossible. Another thing so I want there's to also add some, is... there's some also no go theorems, uh, and I don't really want to go into the technical technicalities yeah. of it. But uh, uh, so a no go theorem in physics is uh, well, the, it, uh, it's it's not necessarily uh, just a bad idea. It's an impossible idea, and so if the laws of physics are as we believe that they are and that we've measured with with great accuracy that they are then uh, those type of communications would be 
uh, impossible. Even though the way um, it's just, done locally, I'll, it just doesn't it doesn't work quite like that. I'll just say one thing one thing uh, uh, about that with the quantum entanglement and and uh, the qubits that uh, go to war mentioned, but um, that. There are things like in quantum cryptography, like a quantum key distribution, where you can send uh, some entangled particles from you know A to B, and then you can basically determine whether you have a secure channel. Where because if if there was a, an eavesdropper that was uh, intercepting the message, they would actually affect the entanglement states of the particle, and that the the receiver would know. That the uh, that the that the message had been um, uh, intercepted, based on the fact that it had changed the quantum states. Um, but at, so there is, you know, application for communication through uh, entanglement, um, and you know, I but guess the thing a, is that the thing is is the limitation of of the yes yeah there's the a, a of the, the time a, aspect the time aspect of uh, of confirming that you made that communication and yeah, because that... you still have to communicate ver ver using regular channels right like so Correct. you don't know whether that so even though the quantum state is instantly the wave function collapses and then you know the the other particle has its um has the reciprocal state then you still have to communicate using normal slower than light comms to kind of go did you receive this packet or, well, and here's the even even at the speed of light, I mean, if you're if you're trans uh, if you're communicating at the speed of light, uh, sure, you, it would still take. You wouldn't be it wouldn't be instantaneous, so you, it would still take the same amount of time to communicate. Yeah, and and and, and when so. it comes to comms, and when it comes to comms as well, because um, you know when we're talking about electromagnetic communications, like um, or any kind of communications like serial or whatever, there's a lot of like handshaking that goes on so protocols um like say gsm or whatever they use time division multiplexing frequency division multiplexing or any kind of um transmitter that uses you know um f frequency shift keying gfsk all this all this sort of stuff there's normally a back and forth that goes on with these protocols so it, it kind of eliminates the advantage that you get from that uh you know, inverted commas, information being traveled at, uh, instantaneously. You know, another uh, big, uh, sorry, sorry, Gareton. Uh, uh, what I was going to say is um, another challenge to this debate about qubits is, and I worked for a company, you know, disclosure, like I, they, they, they are into quantum computers and all that. Uh, the biggest elephant in the room with quantum computation or building quantum computers is error data, error correction. Now, the, the no cloning principle, there's a, a principle called no cloning principle. That means a qubit, single qubit cannot be cloned like the error correction we do with the classical computers. So then you see this race of people trying to build bigger and bigger systems like the, there's a recent like with all this quantum race to build quantum computers like a million qubits you know thousand qubits like right now I, I think a couple of companies are reaching like a thousand qubit that does nothing uh, i'm not sure if a million qubits will be able to do uh, much uh, much computation and then also the issues with decoherence and so yeah nobody has kind of resolved uh, resolved uh, that um you know, error correction in these systems and how to make them, uh, uh, you know, well, not de Yeah, sorry, go ahead. The de de coherence. Yeah, but I was just going to say, we're only up to about 70 qubits is the, the fastest quantum computer at the moment. That's the, then, the Sycamore, Sycamore one. And then the question about quantum key cryptography, uh, you know, um, now, if you have an eavesdropper that, okay, listens to the message, I mean, the person on the other end gets uh, gets a confirmation that somebody intercepted the message, right? They still are able to intercept. And I was wondering, like, that's also an issue. Like, it's not, a, I mean, you know that it your, your signal was detected. Yeah, it's not, 
it's not great because yeah they've mm. intercepted you just know that it's not a secure channel so yeah that's the inherent um, problem with it but um uh, angel wanted to he's got his hand up so just where we let let him hear what he has to say well, i wanted to start by saying most of the stuff you guys are talking about i have is like way over my head and i don't understand but it is in an area that i i am interested in and i wanted to know what you think about uh, the Mandela effect and CERN, not related the two, but or if they are, I don't know. Um, but just those two things. The Mandela Mandela effect is awesome. I love it. I think it's hilarious um, because you know, if for people who don't know, you know, it's it's this idea that um, people have this this shared consciousness, and that uh, sometimes uh, somewhere along the timeline, people realize that all well, that what they what they think as a memory has of something that's happened, like an event, turns out to be a false memory, and then, but that's a shared false memory from lots of people. So there's all sorts of uh, funny examples of it. One is that people think that you know, Mandela uh, died in prison, that he didn't actually come out of prison and then become the uh, the president of South Africa, but um, so somehow that's like a shared, you know, false memory. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. One of my favorites is I think everyone seems to remember this movie about a genie uh, in like the eighties with like uh, Sinbad in it or something. And, uh, but like that never happened. And there's, there's a whole bunch of other ones that are hilarious, but I, I would, I would argue that that's probably nothing supernatural or like, it's probably just the fact that human memories are very malleable. And that every time we access memories, um, we kind of imprint on those memories again. And that's why like uh, eyewitness accounts are terrible uh, forms of evidence because you can have multiple people that all witness the same event and give you completely different, um, you know, uh, series of events that occurred. So, but that's probably not as exciting of an answer that you're hoping for. And no, you no, no. It actually it. is, sorry. It's really actually more exciting because I, I, uh, I started to question my own memories at some point, and uh, I rely more on, like, raw data more than the things that I think I've seen or what I believe is real. Um, and I don't know what caused that, but just oh, 100%. confusion, maybe. <laughs> I think No, I think everyone does that. Everyone does that. When you access long-term memories and you imprint on it your, your current state, and then those memories change and 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 there's all sorts of uh, things that happen with memories, but I'd say that's probably, you know, it's the the human uh, the flesh bag that we're in that has its um, uh, inadequacies uh, and just how the brain works. But it is interesting to see that it happen at like a at a, a large scale. And I'm sure there are lots of people that talk about you know there's this whole um, hundred monkeys idea and 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 or, or one thousand monkey, you know that. That, that is like a, a level of consciousness that once enough people understand a concept, then it just levels up and that every people understand it. But that is very philosophical, I guess. Um, hokey, hokey, hokey is the right word. <laughs> hokey. Well, oh. hey, no, no, look, look, I don't, I don't judge. I don't judge. I, I, I have to say this, that I will always entertain any idea because a lot of ideas seem hokey um, when you, if you go back far enough, you know, you go back and you show someone uh, a plane, for example, you know, and, and you can say, oh, well, you can get in a, in a jet and, and, or SR-71 and, or the International Space Station and we can do all sorts of shit. They would have just been, that's magic. You guys are, are witches, burn you at the stake. Um, and that's that whole, I think it's Arthur C. Clarke, where um, any sophisticated form of technology is imperceptible from magic because if you're at a technological level where you don't understand it, you just have to say, oh, it's magic. Um, and so when people say, come up with ideas and you sort of discount them as, as not real, uh, there's always a non-zero probability that they're onto something and we just, it's a limit in our current human understanding. Um, but I do like to bring it back to experimental measurements. So when I talk about physics, um, I like to entertain, entertain all ideas, but then I want to show me the data, show me the experiment, show me how it's repeatable in the scientific method in laboratories across the world. And then we can, you know, build on that.
we'll observables. soon find out with the superconductor thing. We'll soon find out, right? The uh, room, the room temperature superconductor. No, it's the room, con yeah. yeah, room temperature. Yeah, I, it, it, I, I, I thought so. I talked to one of my friends about uh, about that paper, and he said that the one thing that he was encouraged by, he said, "We'll know in a few weeks uh, whether or not it's real or not." And he said, "Don't, don't get too excited." But the uh, the one thing is is that they did not shoot for the moon, so they've had a breakthrough, but they didn't shoot for the moon as far as like the amperage that uh, that they could put across the uh, the conductor, which is you know that's that's encouraging because if you if they if they, why would you lie about kind of a, a a moderate result? I mean it's a break it's a major breakthrough, but it uh, it would be a moderate commercial result. And so if you're going to invest in any superconducting, uh, <laughs> any venture capitalist, you're going to lose your money uh, because this is, this is how the process works. It will, they find a certain set and then they, they refine that set as much as they possibly can to get them the, the biggest bang for your buck. You know, but as far you... as, as far as, hold on, hold on one, one second, I did have a point, uh, another point. Uh, so they're asking about CERN and the, the number of papers that I read about, you know, black hole production at CERN. Yes, all of those were possible, but they didn't necessarily, they, those corresponded to particular models that uh, the parameter spaces eventually got called out. And, you know, we make mistakes or scientists make mistakes all the time. Of the opera experiment where they measured uh, uh, the velocity of of these neutrinos and I can still remember when that happened uh, the result was, showed that there was faster than light travel with these All neutrinos right. yes. and and then on the archive which are the where you can go to the archive uh, archive.org every day there's new physics papers being pre uh, presented. Not all of them are right. But every <laughs> for a solid week, they had cases for and cases against. And they tried to explain why that it was faster than the speed of light, why it wasn't. Now, the most compelling argument of why it couldn't have been uh, faster than the speed of light is that there was no measurable shock wave. Uh, because it's an electroweak particle, uh, electro particle, very similar to uh, shrink-off radiation when you have a charged particle moving in a, uh, in a medium, so like water, where the index of refraction is, uh, is different than, the, than the, uh, that in air, you'll see a shock wave, and then so a blue glow emerges. And that's just because it's a uh, charged particle moving faster than the speed of light in that medium, not in the vacuum, but in that medium. You would have the same type of effect where you would have electroweak particles jetting out <laughs> from these uh, faster than light neutrinos. So those are measurable things that we can see that would happen if that was the case. It turned out that the guy had, uh, had plugged it in incorrectly. There was... Yeah. Uh, and which is quite unfortunate because he did lose his job over that. Yeah, they should. They should. And you know what? I am not sure about this superconductivity paper. I'm not ruling the possibility out yet. But then are we saying, and I wanted to get you both of your opinions, um, that this is completely lossless because there is some inductive losses in superconductors, right? So... Uh, if not resistive, but there are inductive losses. Oh, yeah, 100%. There's resistive losses, capacitive losses, inductive losses. There's all sorts of losses, um, particularly in experimental measurement. I mean, uh, I work in electromagnetic uh, laboratory, and uh, the amount of losses that you have to compensate for, um, even uh, thermal losses and, and things like that. Uh, and these losses are... Uh, proportional to frequency as well so there's there's all you know you could go into the nth degree about uncertainty of measurement because you can't even when you're measuring a frequency um and you take into account all the losses at that frequency you know uh with a spectrum analyzer 
um, you, you only would ever give that uh, even to nine decimal places, you know, which is easy to do, but you would still give that with a measurement uncertainty and a confidence interval. So uh, measurement uncertainty, all that sort of stuff, a very you know statistical approach to um, uncertainty and, and measurement that's uh, very real. And, and un unfortunately, a lot of experiments don't take into account a lot of losses. Um, and then they make claims that eventually get debunked. So, um, but I guess like, I wanted to try and steer the ship back towards black holes because if we start talking about uh, semiconductors at room temperature or, or whatever, then we're sort of uh, we're, we're, we can do that next week or whatever. But we, you know, maybe we need to keep on theme. Um, was there anything else, Graviton, that you were you know wanted to say that particularly things that are sort of fantastic that uh, about black holes that you think that people might be interested in? Well, so. So the, the the pictures that I uh, was sharing, uh, so like we were talking about, there is uh, uh, black holes can have mass, uh, black holes can have charge, black holes can have spin. If you assume, uh, and so all of these uh, equations uh, basically assume that the stress energy tensor is zero, it vanishes. So they're vacuum solutions. So you don't even, but you just have an object that you have defined with mass, and so mass is kind of this just this quantity in in, in special relative, in a general relativity. Anyway, but it's not necessarily a collapsed star. But these are but they're still solutions. But what they indicate is that there are uh, uh, you can get, as you were saying before, the parallel universes. But even in so with those diagrams, nothing can move beyond a 45 degree angle. That's the fastest it can do. So if you look at the Schwarzschild, there's two components to that. There's our universe and a parallel universe. There is no way to communicate to that parallel universe. Uh, because of because of the presence of the black hole. I just think it's pretty interesting. People are like, uh, yeah. Well, there can't be, you know, there can't be multiverses, but, you know, it is a solution to the equations, whether or not those solutions have any validity to them or not. Yeah. Is, and whether you can traverse. Right. But that's not yeah, testable, you... right? Graviton, that's not testable, right? That's my issue with the multi-universe theory is. Well, not yet. <laughs> I, I'm not even talking about, like, I'm just saying that they are solutions to the equations. Yeah. Whether they're testable or not, you can't you can't disprove them either. But but that's mathematics, right? Like physics is concerned with the testable hypothesis. I mean, if we what happens is uh, like whoa, 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 whoa. hold on one second. So I I I I'm I'm going to agree with you on on this on that point because this is not the collapsed star. These uh, the solution Schwarzschild uh, Kerr. Uh, uh, Nordstrom, they're not the collapsed star solutions. So, where you would say in the asymptotic past, this was a this was not a black hole, but in those particular solutions, so they don't really represent reality. I will say that 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 those solutions don't represent reality, but there's also some interesting phenomenon that happens within those solutions. But uh sometimes we have to uh why is that important we have to kind of break down uh there's simplicities that we make along the way to solve these equations these equations are very hard and proving that they're hard uh, they're proved this difficult to, uh, to solve one of the consequences and this may or may not have something to deal with reality but in the Kerr solution, which is the uh, rotating black hole, uh, there are closed time-like curves. And what does that mean? That's a time-traveling mechanism within the Kerr solution. Now it's it's hidden behind the sing uh, behind the event horizon. And now is that a tor toroidal singularity with those Kerr rotating black holes? There's something about the singularity that makes them 
toroidal or something? Yeah, so there's multiple components to uh, to the Kerr black hole that that don't emerge into the uh, merge in the short style solution. You have the yeah, sphere. Uh, but but anyway, those closed time like curves are probably one of the most fascinating things in it, and and so it's kind of terrifying <laughs> to have closed time like curves in your in in your space time geometry uh, because it would indicate that you know you could go back in time and you could have all these paradoxes. Uh, and so that led Roger Penrose, or Penrose to conjecture that uh, that there is no naked singularities, and that's a rather spicy title, but uh, because that would just be such a horrible thing for that uh, is called the uh, uh, the cosmic uh, censorship conjecture. It's not proven, but uh, but in order to avoid those those potential things but rotating black holes do exist so the full the full solution to her doesn't exist that's the full analytical continuation of it uh so while you say that that's mathematics sure but that's all we're really talking about the right Danny, when, I, when i hear time travel i i just uh lose interest because yeah, well, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's problems with, so the grandfather paradox is probably the biggest problem with time travel, right? So you go back in time, you kill your own grandfather, then you can't exist to go back in time and kill your own grandfather. So um, there's lots of things that we just may, it makes no sense to kind of talk about not even that, um, on your timeline. Yeah, not even that. Like, since our notion of time, like this notion of time, this forward moving arrow, like it's more like to do with entropy or change in events, right? Rather than when people say, oh, well, uh, you know, time travel is possible or we are I'm seeing not it. saying that yeah. it's possible. I'm just saying it is a consequence of, if you believe, if you believe general relativity is, is, is correct to describe the macro, uh, you know, uh, the macro universe. And, yeah, and, we cannot into we our cannot, well, hang on. Hey, can I just say, yeah, time travel is possible. You can go forward in time. That's 100%. that's there's no 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 problem with that. You can go forward 100%. in time. You, you you go you go near a black hole. Your time will slow down relative to someone that is not being you know affected by that gravity. If you go at tremendous speeds, like they had those two twins that one went on the ISS and one came back. The one that came back was slightly older than the one that that went on the ISS. Like so, you can travel forward in time, hundred percent. You just can't Correct. travel backwards. So the, the, <laughs> yes, but but topologically, but it, but those are geodesics. So the uh, matter travels within its own geodesic. So it could either be the null geodesic if you're if you're massless, or you can have a massive geodesic. The problem with uh, Kerr behind the behind the event horizon is that there are closed time like geodesics. So it is actually a literal solution to the mo to equ the equations of motion uh, in Kerr. It's also it's not unique to Kerr. Uh, Gödel, Kurt Gödel, uh, the the greatest logician uh, since Aristotle, uh, in one of his walks with Einstein, he presented him with a uh, uh, with a, a solution to his equations using. Uh, 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 dust as the stress energy tensors, uh, and they also have closed time like loops. So, any but any time that you have closed time like loops means that the mass, a uh, massive geodesic, which is equations of motion, it, it is present. I mean, you have to figure out what to do with that, whether or not it exists or not. Now, exterior short child, exterior curve. No time like curve, no close time like curves exist, but they are part of the solution. You know, Kurt de Gerdel, yeah, that... his whole theory of um, what was the incomplete theorem. Yeah, so then to that, Wittgenstein had an answer uh, that the self referential nature of that could be included, like the inconsistencies could be included in, in a system that considers those inconsistencies and then you know, those things go away. So Kurt Gödel's theoretical framework doesn't have like, I would say, because I come from computational background 
it, you know, I, I was a fan of Kurt Girdle, Girdle, and then I read Wittgenstein's kind of take on it, and I was like, okay, this is interesting. But anyways. Uh, well, the, the uh, I, I think that uh, there's a lots of readings of Girdle that uh, I, it really attacks the foundational uh, pieces of mathematics were to were to you to say that there are unanswerables yeah but mathematics the axioms, you know you have well yeah there's there's consistent axioms but that's way off the topic but i'm just saying that again if you if you believe i what einstein is is showing is some uh you know approximation of the of the macro uh explanation of gravity which it it for the best that we have as far as uh, the measurements of uh, gravitational waves, not only at LIGO, but the, uh, the pulsar measurements that indicate uh, that Einstein is, hasn't been shown to be incorrect or incompatible with observation. There are consequences in that theory that you have to deal with and you have to understand. And so, and everything is, is up for, up for for discussion. Um, I've got to disappear soon, mate. But um, just before I do, I just wanted to sort of introduce, uh, you know, the, the the topic of of dark matter into it, um, because you know it's one of those things where there's been some recent things where people were sort of speculating that dark matter or dark energy could actually be, you know, as a result of black holes and things like that. And you know, we know that like most of the observable mass only makes up like 5% of, of what we would expect there to be in the universe if you measured, you know, gravitational redshift and things like that. Um, and so I just wanted to get your take on that in terms of like, we have this, you know, we, we've measured the cosmic microwave background. We know that the universe is expanding and not only is it ex that it's expanding, that it is, that that expanding, this kind of, uh, you know, the reciprocal this aspect of, of, uh, of gravity. Of, but if you're thinking about gravity in terms of curved space-time, um, it, it doesn't really make sense, unless you're talking about the vacuum energy that's pushing the space apart. Um, but, yeah, just that idea of uh, there is some sort of mass that is unaccounted for in the universe, like seventy percent of the of the mass of the universe, and so we can we can break that down into uh, types of dark matter, like weakly interactive massive particles, like uh, neutrinos that are just streaming through us that just aren't interacting with us, um, and they have like non-zero mass that that accumulates into like some part of the hidden mass, and then you have you know, massive compact halo objects which are like you know, uh, brown stars and things that aren't reflective or luminous. Um, but what I'm talking about is like the, the dark energy sort of side of things, which is not very well quantified. Um, what do you think about that in terms of, of black holes? And, and do you think black holes have some sort of are responsible for some of that dark energy that's driving the expansion of the universe? So based on the, on the data that was, that was just published, there was very, there, um, the vast majority of the black holes observed were normal black holes from uh, regular matter. They didn't indicate any dark, uh, dark matter, dark energy. But this is a repulsive uh, force that you're talking about. I have some, I have some issues, fundamental issues with this, uh, and this is kind of stemming from the fact that this uh, we've we've still not observed any of the candidates for dark energy, dark uh, matter. I mean, the cosmological constant is very small. If you equate it to the, uh, the, the vacuum energy of the universe, then the, va uh, the vacuum energy of the universe is actually very large. It's a very big number, not a very uh, small number. So uh, what's the difference? You also have a set of uh, particles that appear since we haven't been able to reproduce them at any of the particle accel accelerators that they seem to be uh, non uh, non standard model uh, interactions. Where did the what mechanism caused the decoupling 
of the two. And I mean, there's a lot of questions and from a theoretical point of view. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, there's something, there's something more than baryonic matter. But, uh, you know, the, the candidates that they have so far proposed that it, I, it's not, it's not convincing from an experimental point of view. Perhaps if we would have seen supersymmetry, uh, it would have, uh, you know, uh, TV supersymmetry, it would be uh, 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 potential, uh, you, you know, it, it could have given rise to some potential candidates. Yeah. But yeah. The, well, the that's something thing, we could maybe talk about next time. Absolutely. Is, has everyone enjoyed super, this super conversation? Symmetry. Yeah, I mean, I have. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have 100%. Too. I'm just... So it's been it's been really fun, and like um, I'd like to get your your take on uh, you know the standard model and supersymmetry and um, and all of the sort of you know particle and particle pairs and things like that as well. Um, and yeah, and maybe dive a little bit more into um, dark matter and dark energy as well. So maybe we can do that in a in another space. How does standard model, the gravity fits into the standard model? I mean, that would be awesome if we have answers, you know. We, we do not have answers. <laughs> right. <laughs> that will be the breakthrough. Yeah, there's a theory of everything where you, right. you want to combine, you know, the the electroweak, the strong, the electromagnetic, and the gravitational. And and that's the, the holy grail of, of physics. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we can we can uh, attempt to uh, explain some of these things, but th so far we have to say that uh, there is no um, uh, theory of everything. There's no, there's no, there's, there's, it's hard to reconcile quantum gravity and relativity uh, at this stage. Yeah, as Penrose says, there is some issue with our uh, theory of quantum, uh, quantum, you know, theory of quantum mechanics is something missing for sure. Well, maybe we could talk about super strings or something like that at, at another thing. I'm, I'm sure Graviton can enlighten us a bit about that. Or membrane theory, and there's all sorts of things. Yeah. Count me out. I'm kidding. <laughs> no worries. All right. I've got a jet, guys. So um, thanks very much uh, for, for the interesting discussion. And... Um, uh, yeah, Top Gun for talking about that uh, that warp drive thing. That was cool. Uh, so I, I want to uh, look into that a bit more. I've heard about that EM drive. Um, I'm not sure if, if that's a different one, but that there's a few other things like that that are very interesting. And particularly from a, you know, the actual nuts and bolts mechanical, the engineering side, that's also interesting for me. So, um, so we're but anyway, about, we're thinking about doing sorry, these, these uh, every other week. Um, yeah, maybe fortnightly. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, what do you all think about that? Can we get some emojis for that? Sounds good. So we'll Sounds try good. to do, do this again in a couple of weeks and then, uh, you know, we'll figure out where this goes. Yeah, and look, if anyone wants to, you know, um, suggest uh, topics or themes and things like that, that's always good as well. So, um uh, because it's probably better to have lots of you know smaller spaces that are on on theme before otherwise if we go too far down rabbit holes then it, you know it, it um we lose lose track of the of the idea that you know the initial theme that we were going with all right guys well i better disappear but um i'm actually going to go see oppenheimer so <laughs> Um, I'll catch you guys later and, um, thanks very much. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.